Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to HBCU Game Day. Special guest today, Corey Diaz. He's with the new star. He's down in the boot, man. He covers grambling, a little La Tech, and, and, and he has the swag flavor from an early age. Corey, I just found out, man, you grew up just blocks away uh, from Alabama State, man. So you, you've been... You you've known the temperature of the swag for for quite a while now, right? Yeah, you know it's all about geological footprint, right? I grew up kind of right in the heart of of swag country, so yeah, no, nah, I've I've I live just blocks away from Alabama State's football stadium. Uh, you know, I used to like to open my window, you know, on Saturday mornings uh, and listen listen to the you know the marching hornets. Uh, was one of my favorite pastimes so um you know that's home for me you know you know I, we just we talked about you being at the magic city classic this past weekend you know that, that's something that uh you know i'm well versed in i grew up kind of around that so uh, it's fun to uh you know always talk to various people around uh the swag whether it be people covering or people you know directly involved at, at different institutions uh you know in the conference and just kind of get to know their backstories a little bit so that's always cool well, Corey, you do a great job uh, writing for Grambling. You're, you're my go-to source. Whenever I, whenever I hear something, I'm like, let me see if Corey has it. Or a lot of times I don't find out anything's going on until I, I read it with you and, and your work there uh, with the News Star. Uh, tell me a little bit, and, and I'll, forgive me if I'm boring everybody, but whenever I talk to my media friends, I'm just like you, man. I, I want to know their backstory. Uh, where did you develop the love uh, for penmanship in writing, man? How did that come about? Oh, great question, Tolly. Um, you know, it was one of those things that I I feel like I didn't know at first. Um, you know, uh, you know, when we would have, you know, whether it be book reports or you know essays or, or some shape of shape, form, or fashion of, of a writing assignment, you know, while I was in high school. Um, you know, when I think back on it, I always got pretty good marks on, on those particular assignments, but never really thought about in the enjoyment that I would get got out of doing those particular assignments. Um, and it's funny, you know, when I graduated high school enrolled at the university of Alabama, uh, you know, I thought I wanted to be a broadcast anchor. I thought I wanted to be, you know, on camera, you know, behind the desk, you know, reading the, reading out the news to, to the viewers. Um, so I took the intro class at Alabama and, and not a not not necessarily a knock on my professor or anything, but I just didn't enjoy it. I, I, I for whatever reason, I didn't gel with it. Um, and so when I went home for Christmas, uh, Christmas break that year, my freshman year, uh, I was just thinking more and more about it. And, and I said, you know what, I don't necessarily want to leave the communication school. I want to would like to stay inside of it, try something else inside of that. And so uh, journalism was there in the catalog. And I said, all right, I'll try that, you know, and so I took the intro class and, uh, you know, Dr. Keller, he was my intro to journalism teacher at the University of Alabama. Uh, he, I, you know, I credit him with, with uh, me getting to where I am today. He's one of the big, one of the big influences on, on my writing career, my professional career. Uh, if it hadn't been for his passion each and every day coming into the classroom, uh, teaching his students, you know, about what it is to to be as good a journalist as possible each and every day. I certainly wouldn't be here. So shout out to Dr. Keller. Uh, appreciate him for everything. And it was just one of those things that I, I kind of journalism specifically, I just kind of stumbled into it. And, uh, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, I guess 14 years later, here we are. Oh man, for God, I, I wouldn't have put that many years on you, Corey, man. You, you, <laughs> Tolly, I'm old, man. I am old. I'm not going to, you'll have to do the math yourself, but I'm old. <laughs> well, I think I still got you by, by a little bit, man. So I'll, I'll let you play catch up there. Uh, covering Grambling for, for the last few years, man. What, what has that experience been like, man? That is one of the most iconic brands uh, in all of HBCU football education, what I just like to lump in as the HBCU universe. Uh, what has that experience been like for you? It's it's been it's been incredible, Tolly. Uh, just from the, the the people that I work with each and every day at Grambling State University, whether it be you know people that don't read or see behind the scenes, um, or even the coaches as well. Uh, just a, a top notch organization. Uh, top-notch institution uh, each and every day. I, like I said, I, I thoroughly enjoy getting to work with them. Uh, there, there's so many good stories there. Obviously, you know, you mentioned the, the history and the tradition. Uh, you know, we, you know, here we like to refer to Grambling State as the, uh, you know, 
the black Alabama, you know, it's, it's a brand unlike any other, um, you know, you hear stories all the time about, you know, people wearing G across their chest and they could be in an airport, you know, in, in any corner of this country and someone else see it. And next thing you know, they have a 25 minute conversation about Grambling state. Everybody knows Grambling state. So, uh, I, I love it, man. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, a lot of people have some misconceptions about it, you know, and, and I always try to encourage people to, to, to read more, to research more, to learn more, um, you know, and kind of going back to my background, you know, kind of being around the SWAC and, and, and being around, uh, you know, an HBC, you kind of growing up, I, I, I knew who Grambling was. I knew who Eddie Robinson was. I, I knew the history there, him being one of the winningest coaches in college football history. Doug Williams, you know, being the first black, black Super Bowl winner at quarterback. I, I knew all about that stuff before I even got on this job. And so to me, I, I think to me, kind of my knowledge coming into this beat and covering Grand Lake State, I think it helped me a lot. Uh, it helped me make a lot of really good connections and a really a lot of really good writer source relationships from a, from basically day one. And, and sp specifically with football, if my math is right, you kind of came uh, right on the back end of, of, I don't know if mutiny is the right word, but, but everybody knows what we're talking about. That point where it was like, man, the grambling had really sunk probably to, to its lowest level. Uh, the kids didn't want to play. They were demanding better resources and rightfully so everybody kind of knows that backstory. Uh, you kind of came on the, on the back end of that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, what have you seen uh, with the program as, as they went from that to, you know, going to the Celebration Bowl and, and contending for championships? Yeah, uh, well, you know, my, my first season here was actually 2017. Um, and that was when, you know, Ken K was at quarterback, Martez Carter was at running back. Uh, you know, that that starting defense that particular season, I want to say, had seven All-Americans on it. Um, so I, I came at the – my first year – um, was Grambling State, I believe, playing uh, North Carolina A&T for the HBCU National Championship. And I think they lost that game 21 to 14, if I'm not mistaken. So I, my first year was kind of on the tail end of that that three-year stretch there where, where Grambling didn't lose a SWAC, didn't lose a game in conference, uh, you know, won back-to-back-to-back, you know, SWAC West champion uh, – where SWAC West champions won the, um, I think it was back-to-back -back SWAC championships at that point. I think the right the year before I'd gotten here was when they beat North Carolina uh, Central 10-9 to in the Celebration Bowl that year before. So, you know, that was another cool thing, too, about getting hired onto this beat and taking this job is that I knew that, uh, you know, I was going to be covering a team that's coming off a national championship. So, you know, journalists like us, Tali, I know you can probably attest to this. I mean, it's when you get that opportunity – uh, it's super, it's super exciting because you know that you're, you're about to cover a team and an organization and a program that's, that's successful and has the players and the talent, you know, the coaching staff, uh, you know, kind of all those intangibles that lead to, you know, having a lot of success on the field and, and being around that first team, you know, getting to know Devonte Kincaid really well, uh, getting to know Martez Carter really well. You know, I, I spent I spent the, the draft day, you know, with Martez and his family that year. Um, you know, unfortunately, he didn't get drafted. Um, but, you know, just those relationships, man, it always goes back to those relationships. Um, you know, from from my time, from I would say that first year in 2017, uh, to now, I mean, I mean, you know, this as well as I do, it, it has been a journey for for Grambling State. Um, you know, that bar has had been so high, um, you know, and and Devontae Kincaid and Martez Carter, those types of players that were on that those 2015, 16 and 17 teams, those are almost once in a generation talents, once in a generation players. And it's so hard to. Um, you know, the success, the success that you had with those players, it's hard to duplicate that. Um, and so, and that's why I think you've seen, you know, Grambling going from winning, you know, nine, 10 games a year, you know, being, being in the SWAC championship game, either, you know, either playing for it or winning it and going on to the HBCU national championship game. But that, that's why we've seen that, that steady drop off is because Grambling has spent the last three years trying to find that, that next once in a generation player that can come in and take this team back to back to the promised land. How how rough was this spring on Grambling? What what sense did you get? Uh, they you look they struggled uh, not only with COVID but they struggled on the field whenever they did play. Uh, what was your sense and, and takeaway from 
from how this spring uh, treated Graham fam? It was tough. It was, it, it was tough. Um, you know, I think coming out of last summer, you know, when they knew that, you know, fall football was not going to happen and that they were going to have to play, you know, six games in the spring. I, I think once that decision was, was handed down from, from the SWAC headquarters, um, you know, it kind of it kind of started setting the ball rolling in a direction and that, that was not going to be a, as beneficial for Grambling. Um, you know, you had got, I mean, they're the, the best player, you know, uh, decided to, to not play in the spring and, and enter his name in the NFL draft, David Moore, you know, uh, this time next week, um, you know, we, you and I could probably sit here and talk about, oh yeah, David's now playing on this particular team in the NFL. He just got drafted in the NFL draft. So, you know, when those types of things start to happen, you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to rebound. And, you know, Bob's talked a little bit about this, you know, after the Bayou classic loss this past weekend is that, you know, they had got, they had guys opting out of the spring season and you're in the middle of an academic calendar year. So you can't recruit guys to come in and fill those holes. You, you just have those holes. And so, you know, that was one of the that was one of the major things, um, you know, that that hurt the scrambling team this spring as, uh, you know, the, the holes that that were on the team, there's no way to fill them. You know, you just had to hope that, um, you know, the guys that were you know buried on the depth chart could step up and, and make place for your team. But those are also guys you're having to rely on guys that basically didn't have any significant playing time um, before the spring. And, you know, of course, and you didn't get, you know, it had been you know, 400 some odd days, you know, since they had played a football game and you didn't get, you didn't get spring practice last year due to the shutdown of COVID-19. And, and so uh, it was, the deck was stacked against Grambling State so high and, and I'm not trying to make excuses for that. I mean, I mean I, and, and, you know, Fobbs wouldn't either, you know, every time you go out in the field, you expect to win. Uh, you, you know, you, you trust in the way that you prepare your players and, and you hope that you put your best foot forward and you win the game. So they didn't do that. You know, um, I think the loss to Arkansas Pine Bluff was was really the the situation where uh, I think it opened up a lot of eyes, you know, within the, the Grambling State football program and, and where they really were and where they need to go from here. You know, as bad as the loss was, I think it was good for them in a sense because it showed them, OK, here's where we actually need to go. This is the direction in which we need to head. You know, and so it, it was it was a very disappointing spring, obviously, you know, with them having the, the COVID-19, um, you know, issues within the football program, you know, obviously that that set them up for for what we saw this past Saturday at Independence Stadium, you know, the, the 42 point loss to, to Southern. I mean, they didn't have a they didn't have a team full team practice the last month of the season. You know, how, how do you how do you expect your guys to, to go out there and, and, you know, play a team that's rolling um, and be competitive? I, I, I just don't think it was, there was no way that that was going to happen. And so, um, you know, but Hey, credit to them, man. Look, they, you know, they could have, they could have not played, you know, they could have tried and tried and tried to get out of this game. Um, but Fobbs and his kids, they wanted to play, um, you know, and then obviously, you know, in the long run, you know, getting the, getting those kids, those kind of reps against a really good Southern football team, um, should ultimately in the long run pay dividends for this team. Uh, maybe when they get back in the fall um, and even further along, because you, I mean, you, again, you had, you had freshman walk on starting in this game, you know, so these are kids that are going to be in the program for three, four years. And uh, you hope that these experiences that they got this spring will pay off. Uh, Grambling has a, a pretty highly touted recruit on the way at, at quarterback and Noah Biden uh, and the pretty cool connection with, with Bruce Eugene and, and the role he played. Uh, he didn't steer him there, but he ended up uh, in the end, uh, you know, kind of being the conduit to, to help him get there. So that's a really cool story. We, we talked to both of those guys. Is there a lot of buzz in Grambling uh, about Noah Biden, or is he just going to have to come in and, and earn his stripes like any other recruit? No, I, I, I honestly think Tali uh, from, you know, coaching staff uh, as well as the fans that Noah Bodden is a is a kid that I think everyone uh, that spends time around this football team believes that he I don't know if he could be the next Devonte Kincaid but I but I all the tools are there for this kid to come in 
earn earn the starting job day one and be a, and be a difference maker on this football team. Again, this is this is something that they've been looking for since Kincaid's departure. You know, they've been looking for, you know, uh, almost that that kid at the quarterback spot that can, um, you know, put the whole team on his back and go win a game. And I think Noah Bodden is talented enough to be able to do that. You know, and you meant you mentioned the you know the connection with Bruce Eugene and uh, you know the former Grambling uh, legend himself. Um, something that I'm interested to uh, to watch over this uh, this this shortened off season, Tolly, is um, you know that the OC spot on Grambling State staff is open. Uh, you know, Bruce is uh, you know uh, very well versed on, on you know offensive schematics. Uh, I'm not I'm not saying that he will ultimately be the OC. But I do think he would be interested in that job, and so I'm I'm interested to see if Fobbs is is interested in bringing him on and being the offense coordinator. The connection well, he, he would be very familiar with the quarterback. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like the, the connection's already there. So I mean, Bruce already knows what you can get out of Noah at the quarterback spot. So uh, really interesting uh, storyline there this offseason to to watch Talia here at Grambling State. I, I'm interested to see you know what direction that that Fobbs goes with that OC job. I think that's Fobbs texting you now. Shut up, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> Here's another thing. Talking with uh, Corey Diaz. He he works uh, with News Star there. You can read his work across the world, but but locally in, in Shreveport and Monroe, uh, down in the boot in Louisiana. Um, have you felt a tangible kind of uptick uh, in, in the SWAC brand. Uh, they got a lot of attention this spring. They got a lot of ESPN coverage. Of course, Deion Sanders at Jackson State. I think the fans only allow me to say that his name once a day. They'll get on my case. Uh, but there, there's just been a lot around the SWAC brand. As a, someone who covers the league, have you kind of felt that? I, I have felt that. Um, you know, and I'll be honest with you, Tali, I mean – you know, when when Jackson State made the announcement that they were bringing Dion in to be the head coach, I I, I knew from the moment I read the the release, uh, I said, okay, we're we're about to enter into a new era of, of SWAC football. This is this is going to be it's going to be different from here on out. Um, you know, I, I kind of I kind of had a feeling that you know at some point, you know, the, the major, you know, television networks would, um, you know, be calling, you know, and, and kudos to, to Charles McClellan for recon, recognizing the, the situation, right. And, and saying, look, we, we've got, we've got a guy that can move the needle for us. That's coaching in our league. We, we need to, to exercise every Avenue that we can that's, that's out there in order for us to get our league, our institutions, our football teams out there as much as possible. So, cause you know, sometimes Tolly, I mean, you, you've got, you've got some commissioners and leagues that are completely tone deaf and they don't really know, uh, you know, from a, you know, whether it be financial standpoint or even an athletic standpoint, exactly what would be the, what would benefit their league the best, you know? And so, so, so kudos to, to Charles McClellan for, for really recognizing the situation and seeing what he had there. And, and I mean, you know, Jackson state and, um, you know, Alabama A&M, you know, these schools getting on, you know, ESPN2, playing football games. Um, you know, this is something that these that these coaches will will put in their recruiting, you know, hat and, and they'll and they'll recruit kids, you know, this way they'll use it, you know. And so, um, you know, and I kind of like I kind of like the um, the back and forth that we've been seeing, too. I think. OK, I know I know trash talk is like this very polarizing thing in sports. You know, you've got this large faction of people that say, oh, you know, they just need to keep their head down and stay focused on their team. But, you know, you got I, I fall on the side of like, let's do it. Like, let's let's have the guys just just take the mic at their press conference every week and and, and, and try to light into the other coach or have players light into the other players on the other team. Like, let's trash talk. I mean, I mean, that that's part of being a competitor. Right. Is that you honestly believe that that's your team and, and you're the best of the best. So talk like it, you know, I, I like it. The, the whole Connor Mayer stuff and, and Deion Sanders going back and forth. I, I, I've, I've enjoyed it so far. I've been watching it from a distance, of course, but uh, it's been really fun to watch. Uh, so interesting that, that you brought that up. I, I have a theory. I have a working theory that for, for the Deion Sanders experience to fully work in the swag, 
that he's going to need a foil. It can't just be, you know, Dion, the Godfather, that's, you know, bringing us the exposure. Everybody's thankful. Thank you, Dion. And not to say that people aren't grateful. Everybody knows who he is and what he brings. That's understood. I don't think we have to say it every week. Uh, but to have somebody like Maynard to say, look, man, <laughs> this is still football. <laughs> There's still a lot of testosterone here. Uh, and it's, it's part of the kinsmanship, especially with the swag culture, that guys go back and forth. And they don't literally mean what they say. They're going to all shake hands and be friends afterwards. Uh, but I think it's going to be, it can be maximized if somebody plays the foil. But on the other side, Corey, uh, this is also part of my working theory. I have too much time to think about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be hard, I think, uh, for Coach Sanders to really dig in with that because from the outside, it'll be easy to write a headline that says uh, Deion Sanders squabbling with FCS coach for, for people who are just looking for, you know, something to click on and they don't understand the context or care about the context is really a fine line for Sanders where other coaches might have a little more leeway and having fun with it. Yeah. You know, that, I think in I think in all of college football, uh, and I would probably even say most collegiate athletics. You know, regardless of what sport it is, you know, I mean, you, you you're always you always have these coaches, you know, in these respective leagues that, you know, they're they're always going to be, you know, they always rub elbows with each other and rubbing shoulders. You know, whether it be at you know conference media days or you know any other function within the within the league that that brings them together. You know, and so. I, I guess you do have to question, you know, how much is it for show and how much is it, you know, how much is actually meant, you know, um, I don't know. Part of me kind of believes that, that, that Maynard kind of, I think he stuck his chest out a little bit. I think he meant what he said, you know, I, I think Dion may have been playing a little bit, but I, I think, I think Maynard actually kind of took it personally a little bit. Um, but I, I still think it's good for the league, man. I, I, I you know, because we don't get enough of this, you know, that that's something that's outside of the box. And again, you know, I, I go back to last summer when the SWAC made the decision to postpone football from fall and move it to spring. Uh, Tali, I know you remember this, but they were the first FCS league to do that. They were the first ones to jump out on that ledge and say, you know what, it's safe for us because our, our member institutions do not have unlimited resources like the Texas A&Ms and the Texases and Oklahomas and Alabamas and LSUs. They don't have that. It's just not going to be safe for us to play football in the fall. So let's wait three more months and then let's have our guys play six games in the spring. They were the first ones to do that. And, and if you remember correctly too, I, I mean, the national media outlets jumped all over that and they, and they got, you know, a day, day and a day and a half's worth of, of press, you know, on, on the TV, you know, the, on the national TV stations. Um, and, and it was all praise. It was all good. And so, you know, I know a lot of times, you know, in our business, you know, you hear the phrase that, you know, uh, any publicity is good publicity. And it's like, well, I mean, I kind of believe that, um, you know, so that kind of ties in this, you know, Dion squabbling with, with, you know, fellow SWAT coaches, like, you know, some people probably say, well, that's, that's bad press. Well, but, it's getting the league talked about. And I think at the end of the day, that's got to be the, that's got to be the number one priority for the SWAC is, is trying to have, you know, whether it's, you know, teams in the SWAC, you know, go across the scroll at the bottom of the screen or whether it's Deion Sanders or, or, or what have you, something, someone or, or some team affiliated with the league, you want that popping up. You want that scrolling across the bottom of your screen each and every day. And so, um, you know, I think as long as Dion's in the league and, and who knows, I mean, we saw Eddie George, Eddie George is going to coach Tennessee state, um, you know, starting in the fall, funny enough, you know, Grambling opens up at the hall of fame game in Canton, Ohio against Tennessee state. So Fobs goes from opening this past year uh, against Dion Sanders and Jackson state. And then this coming, this coming season in the fall is going to open the year against Eddie George and Tennessee state. Who knows? I mean, maybe the, maybe the next opening in the slack, you know, maybe they, maybe that school goes out and, and gets a, you know, a, another big name income when it comes to, you know, having a good NFL career or what have you. So making those splashes like that, it's going to be really good for the league. Yeah. You know, fan, fans have been on, on both sides of this as I read the comments, you know, at least on our content on social media. Uh, but I, I think when you look at it, you know, the big picture, man, 
you know, Deion Sanders, Eddie George, they won't coach there forever. Uh, at some point, you know, somebody's going to have to replace them. Uh, and just think about the value that they have brought to the position. I, it seems to me uh, that the school would be able to bring in an even higher level candidate because they have a, a high level employee that, that's leaving. So I see tons of positives from it. Uh, you know, people, fans will, will say whatever they want, but uh, I think it's been all good the last few months, man. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, I think a lot of these other schools just by just by association are, are going to benefit, um, you know, from a, and it's really just from a recruiting standpoint, you know, and again, you know, it goes back to, you know, now these coaches can go into when we when we get the, uh, you know, recruiting dead period, you know, officially lifted, you know, and these coaches can get out on the road again and start recruiting kids in person. Um, you know, I mean, they can sell that, you know, hey, you know, this past year, this past spring, we had, you know, the league had, you know, 10 games that were, you know, either streamed on ESPN three or broadcasted on ESPN two or ESPN, you know, they, they can sell that now. And, um, you know, and, you know, some of these kids, you know, they, they like the competition. And so, you know, say like a Broderick Fobbs, you know, from Grandley State can go to a kid's house and say, hey, look, you know, we're going to play Jackson State next year. And guess who's coaching? you'll have a chance to be on our team and, and beat a, and beat a, a, a Deion Sanders led Jackson state team. Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to do that? So I, I think, I mean, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna make the swag better from top to bottom. And um, you know, I, I mean, Mississippi Valley state, you know, that's been, you know, kind of the, the doormat for, you know, the league and football for the last handful of years. I mean, I, I thought that that was the best Mississippi Valley state team I've seen in a, in a long time. And so I said the same thing. I, I saw them yeah. in Alabama State. The, they made they made a terrible call on on a fourth and short deep in their territory, and the game got away from them. But man, for for three and a half quarters, it was anybody's game. I, I've been yeah. preaching that. I think people have been <laughs> kind of like rolling their eyes at me, but I'm like, <laughs> Valley's not that bad this spring. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, they were light years better than what I've seen. I mean, I think it was. I think my first year covering Grambling State, I'm pretty sure uh, Valley came to the hole at Grambling. And I think, I think Grambling hung 70 on them, if I remember correctly. Like it, it was 70 to seven or something was the final score. I, I don't, I, I don't think Valley gets beat like that anymore. That's what I'm saying. Like they're, they were a much better team this year. Uh, that's obviously a lot of that was came before Dion came on board. Um, but, you know, again, I, even the, even the Mississippi Valley States are, are going to benefit from having Dion in the league. They're going to be able to sell this to kids, um, you know, and, and two, you know, with Dion being able to already bring in, you know, these four star guys, you know, these these FBS, you know, um, you know, guys that are defecting, you know, um, that's going to be good for the league, too, because these kids that are coming up are already seeing these other guys commit to play football at these HBCUs. You know, we, we kind of see it, you know, Noah Botton, you know, deciding to go to Grambling State. I mean, Noah had 20 plus offers from, you know, a lot of the a lot of the big major brand FBS schools. And so he decided to not go to any of those schools, but to come to Grambling State. You know, this is a trend that I think we, we've seen for a couple of years now. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a trend that continues and grows as we as we go and go. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's it seems like the momentum is there. Uh, so it's definitely something that, that we will uh, watch, man. And it, it's good for your business. It's good for my business. It's, it's good for the school. So uh, I think everybody's on board with that. Uh, Corey Diaz, what, what are some things, man, that you got cooking or, or some things that you got canned that, that you'd love people to, to check out and read? How can they follow you? Give, give us all the deets, man. Yeah, sure. Uh, you always, you guys can always stay locked in with me. Uh, you know, I'm big on Twitter. I'm on there all the time uh, at Corey Diaz underscore TNS. That's C O R Y D I A Z underscore TNS. Uh, I've got a Facebook page with the same handle as well. Um, you know, I like to keep everyone as tuned in as possible. And, um, you know, man, you know, I kind of talked a little bit about it already, but, you know, uh, there's, there's some openings on, on Fobbs' staff, you know, and, and uh, this off season is probably going to spend a lot of, a lot of energy and a lot of time on, um, you know, what, what's the direction, you know, what, what's the next move for, for Fobbs and his staff and, and how it, how it's going to, 
you know, uh, change the team? You know, what's it going to change offensively? What's it going to change defensively? Um, you know, what are what are the expectations uh, for this team as we, you know, as we're coming off of a of a spring season and you only have a couple months before you have to, you know, get ready for fall. So um, there, there's a lot of really, really good things, a lot of really big things uh, happening around the Grambling State football program right now that I think a lot of people would be interested in. So uh, I would just say uh, stay stay tuned. Uh, there's a lot of lot of good things coming coming down the pipe. Yep, he'll be on it. Make sure you follow him. He's Corey Diaz with the News Star. Corey, thanks a lot for hanging out with this man today and talking a little grambling and HBCU sports. I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, absolutely, man. I just want to take this time to say, uh, Tali, Stephen, uh, love you guys, man. Appreciate uh, the work that you guys do. Uh, I don't think anybody in our business works as, works harder than you guys. Uh, I just appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to come and hang out with you guys because, uh, you know, you guys are the best in the business. So anytime I get the, a chance to uh, to have, a, have some fun with, with you guys, I, I'm always going to be available. All right, man. He's Corey Diaz. Appreciate it, brother. We'll talk to you soon, man. All right. Sounds good, guys. Y'all take care.